think that I have that on my own machine too, yeah. Because <laughs> it's just too happy not to do. Of course. Alrighty, so, um, so questions. Anybody happy with PA5? No. What? <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we'll, we'll do informal presentations starting on Monday and basically um, I'll just have a laptop up here you can log into your Linux account and basically all I'm looking for is you know tell us everybody who's on your your team um, show us your program working and I'll let you pick a knapsack that data file or files of your own choosing, but if you pick a really uninteresting one, I might ask you to make it more interesting. Um, but show us your code working, um, and then you can give us a quick talk through of your code itself. But if there's anything in particular that stands out about your code, anything that you really struggled with or that you finally got to work and you thought was kind of cool, you can talk about that. Um, and I also want you to talk about sort of the group aspect of the project, so how you broke the project up among the group members, and did you stick with that or did it get changed over time, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not like a formal presentation, it's just sort of uh, presenting your work and results to the class. So we'll do that starting Monday. But I also want one person from each group to upload to Canvas by the deadline. Does that make sense? All right, well, if there's no questions, let's talk more about Huffman coding. So we, we went through an example of this yesterday, right? The idea was to have a variable length code so that things that you're finding more frequently in your file take less space to store so that overall, hopefully, you get a win on the total size. And so I had a frequency table like this. So these are relative frequencies. Higher is more frequent. And we'd like to know how to code this efficiently. So this is a good application for a heap. If we take this and we build a min heap where we sort based on the frequency, this will work really well. And with only seven letters, it's not a big deal, but if you had some huge dictionary of things to represent, right, efficient um, structures for finding the minimum would be useful. So, but we'll just do this by hand. So what I want to do is I want to find two entries with the smallest frequencies. And if, if it's not unique, that doesn't matter. I can pick any two entries with the smallest frequency. Well, the smallest frequency is the letter D. So I'm going to pick that. And the next smallest frequency is either C or G. I'm just going to go from the top to the bottom. I'll say C is the next one. And I'm going to write down the frequencies under these. And I'm going to put them next to each other. And I'm going to let them be the children of a node in a tree. And the root of that tree, I'm going to label with the sum of their frequencies. So I'm going to put a 3 here. And the idea is that if I look at D and C collectively, the f chance of getting one of those, the frequency of getting one of those is three, right? Because this happens once every whatever our unit is and twice every, and so three is the sum. Um, and so the chance of seeing a D or a C is bigger than the chance of seeing, say, a G. Okay, we're going to build a tree like this that's going to let us do an efficient encoding using this, this Huffman coding. Um, so I'm going to keep repeating this process. Okay, I've taken D and C out of my list, but I've added this to my list. Okay, so I've added this kind of like DC has a frequency of 3. Okay, so now I find the two things with the lowest frequency. Well, it looks like 
there's a three and there's a two. So I'm gonna go with G with a frequency of two. And for my three, I could pick B, I could pick F, I could pick DC. Again, I'll just go from the top. We'll get the same efficiency in the end. Um, so I'll say B has a frequency of three and I'll combine those and get a frequency of five. So now we've taken care of B and we've taken care of G. And you get the idea, right? This would be a heap. So I'd be just pulling off from the root twice to find the two minimums. And when I get one of these, like a GB, I would insert that into the heap so that that five will be in the right place. And we just keep doing this. So find the two lowest frequencies we haven't seen already. So it looks like that would be F and DC. So I'm going to have F down here with a frequency of three, and I'm gonna have DC with a frequency of three, and I'm going to let those be the children of a node, and the frequency of that node is six, three plus three. And we just keep doing this until we run out of stuff. So lowest frequency, there's a five, there's a six, there's a five, looks like two fives. So I'm gonna take an A with a frequency of five and my GB with a frequency of five. And I'm gonna put those together with a frequency of 10. And I don't really need to be if I was doing this in code, right, I would need to somehow store that 10 with something that lets me know where it is so I can add this to a tree later on. But for us, we can just kind of eyeball it and find the lowest frequencies. Um, so let's see, we've got an E with a frequency of six and we've got this thing with a frequency of six that I seem to have not written down. So we got E with a six, we got DCF with a six, and we got GBA with a 10. So let's put our two sixes together. So here's my E with a six, there's DCF with a six. Those combine to a frequency of 12. So DCFE is a 12, and GBA is a 10. And I think those are our only things left. So I'm gonna combine those into a 22. And I can call that D, C, F, E, G, B, A, 22. And so I'll remove that as the lowest frequency. And then there's nothing else in our heap, right? There's, there's no other child to pair with this. So this is gonna be the root of our tree. And we're done with the encoding piece. Right, so we've got a Huffman tree, which captures this frequency information, and now we can come up with a coding for each of our letters. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, so here's how we do the coding. Everybody clear how we got the tree? So basically, zero on the left, one on the right. So we're going to start at the root and we're going to traverse our way down to each leaf node. And as we traverse, we're going to keep track of whether we went left or right. If we went left, that's gonna represent a zero. If we went right, that's gonna represent a one. So um, the letter A, how do we get to A? We go right and right, that's going to be the code one, one. The letter B, we go right, left, and right. So that's gonna be the code 101. The letter C, we go left, 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 right. So that's 0, 0, 0, 1. D is gonna be left, 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 left. So that's four zeros. E is gonna be left, right. That's a 0, 1. F is left, left, right, 0, 0, 1. And G is right, left, left. One zero zero. So we only uh, begin at the top. To you always begin at the top, yeah. and you're finding your path to each leaf node. 
And so what's the effect of this? Well, our most frequent letter, E, has a two-bit code, 0, 1. Our second most frequent letter, A, also has a two-bit code, 1, 1. B and F are our next most frequent, and B and F both have three-bit codes. G is next frequent, that's got a three-bit code, and then D and G are relatively infrequent, and those have um, a four-bit code and a three-bit code. <coughs> right, so the more frequent ones have a shorter code. And this wouldn't work, for example, if, if we decided that E was going to be coded as 1, 0, because then we've got an ambiguity. If we see a 1, 0, we don't know if that's the letter E or if it's the beginning of the letter B. Right? So the way this is set up, this should be completely unambiguous. So we start with a 0, 1. The only thing that begins with a 0, 1 is an E. The only thing that starts with two ones is the letter A. A one zero can be followed by either a zero or a one, and a zero zero can be followed by either a one which makes it an F, or a zero which makes it either a C or a D based on the fourth bit. So that's Huffman encoding. Um, and it can be very efficient. Right? It can save you a lot of space. Now one trick to this is since depending on your data, the coding is going to be different, you need to store this coding table somewhere in your file. So usually in the beginning of an encrypt of a compressed file, you'll have some kind of representation of this coding, followed by the actual data of the file. So that's more of your overhead. So a very short file, right, can potentially grow when you compress, because you've got this extra information in there. But if it's millions of bytes, right, that's a tiny price to pay. Yeah? Just a small question. Could When you were building the tree here, could you just switch the C and the G around? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I could have done them in different orders. When I put my A here, I could have put it on the left, okay. which would have changed the final coding. Okay, so there's no definite way of making it. Yeah, and you would you would do something in code. What I was doing here was trying not to crowd myself, so, so that's why sometimes I put on one side or the other. But in your code, you know, you would just take the first thing, put it on the left, second thing on the right, or whatever. You get different codes, but it should end up with the same number of bits. And in fact, when I did this yesterday um, at breakfast, I came up with this coding instead. That was the coding we talked about yesterday. Um, same lengths, but different uh, bit patterns. All right, questions about that? Could you do that on a test? Do you want to do it on the board? Okay. So let me give you a frequency table and go ahead and make a Huffman tree based on this. So find a spot on a board and let's, uh, let's do this in groups. Seven. 
Actually, let me stop you there. So C and D go to two, that's good. Okay, so now you want to know what your two lowest frequencies are. So you had G with a two, you had H with a three, but you've also got a two up there, which is C, D. So the two twos together would be lower than the two and the three. So you want to take your G and make a tree along with that two that you wrote down. So your C D, yeah. All right. So now you got a four. We lost B though. Uh, 
H is a three. I don't know. Uh, 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 so, 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 uh, 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 so, 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 so,
So if, if you've got this worked out, try coding eight characters that all have the same frequency of one and see what you end up with. Oh man. I'm going to ask Nick if we did this up
Probably, so you put four and eight together and got seven. Yeah. That seven probably should have been paired with the F, which is also seven. So you always want to find the two things with the lowest frequency. Oh. So that could have been an F over there. But actually, your B could have come in earlier also. Oh. Okay. I wouldn't know where to put the four, though, because we're using the three. So you got to use a three. So, so let's. Um, Let me so C and D. Yeah. So two the lowest lower G. So I went together and gave it. Yeah. Four and H go together. It gives you a seven. So the lowest ones here are seven and four. So I would pair that with a B. Now you got four and eight pairs. So now you got your uh, seven and eight and ten and eleven. So the seven and eight have to go together. So that could be your D. Yeah. Uh, really? Wait, an odd number of ones. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Good binary. You get you get yeah. Yeah. So there's 21 and 15 in those. I'm glad I just decided not to skip this class. Wait, <laughs> binary. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> So over here would be all zero, and all zero, and all zero, all zero, zero, one, zero. And then that's why, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you do it in different order, then, like, if you start at the bottom row, it's like, okay. it's like, 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 it's Yeah. 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 Yeah.
apologies. No, I think it's really Yeah, good. I mean, I like that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. 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 All right, makes sense. Okay, cool. All right, so that's Huffman coding. I think I think you've got that down. Um, and a few people did this with with um, things with uniform frequency, and you get good old binary encoding, where everything's basically the same length if it's a power of two, and if it's not, then you get an extra bit thrown in. Um, so it kind of generalizes. All right, so that's another useful thing we can do with trees. So let me tell you another cool tree, and we'll play with this one in 223. We'll actually code this up. This is a decision tree. So how many people have played 20 questions? That's the first question. So 20 questions, um, one person thinks of something. Let's say I'm going to think of an animal. And the other person gets to ask yes, no questions, and they try to figure out what animal I'm thinking of. So is it furry? Yes. Does it meow? Yes. Right? And you keep asking questions until you think you know what the animal is. And then they say, OK, is it a cat? And I say, no, it's a genetically modified ferret. And you lose. Um, <laughs> so so we, can, we can code our information that we need in order to play this game as a decision tree. So the root of our tree might be, is it furry? Yes. And if the answer is yes, we might say, does it meow? <laughs> And if the answer is yes, we say it's a cat. And if the answer is no, we say it's a dog. A goblin. Goblins aren't furry. So if it's not furry, um, we can say, does it kill people? And if the answer is yes, we'll say it's a goblin. Not all goblins kill people. And if we say no, then the answer is it's a turtle. So there's our whole knowledge base, right? That's everything we know about, about animals. Oh. And we can play this game with someone. So, so somebody think of an animal. Who's thinking of an animal? OK, is it furry? No. Does it kill people? No. You're thinking of a turtle, aren't you? No, it's a porpoise. A porpoise, OK. <laughs> so, so my sorry. knowledge tree is not quite perfect yet. Okay, it's been tripped up by a very clever animal choice. So, so here's what we do. We say, okay, can you tell me a question that I could ask that the answer would be yes for a turtle and no for a porpoise? Is it amphibious? Okay, so is it amphibious? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, it's a turtle. And if the answer is no, it's a porpoise. And now we've expanded our knowledge. And if I were to play that same game with the same question and answer, when I got down to does it kill people? No, I would say, is it amphibious? They'd say, no. I'd say, oh, it must be a porpoise. And I'd be right in that case. Turtles are reptiles. Turtles are reptiles. Say what? It should be, is it reptilian? OK. Is it a reptile? Which is weird because they breathe underwater sometimes. No, they don't. Um, right. So this is a decision tree. It's also a knowledge tree, right? And this is this is one way that you can sort of code information and make a pretty convincing game that will do a good job of guessing an object. And the cool thing about this is, the more you play it, the better it gets. Because you play the game, and if you get the right answer at the end, that's great. But if you get the wrong answer, you can ask for a question that would help you discriminate. 
and um, does it meow? No, it must be a dog. No, I was thinking of a pig. Okay, so what could I ask that would differentiate a, a pig from a dog? So does it oink? They are furry. You never saw a furry pig? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, is it hairy? And this is one of these problems is, is depending on how people answer these things, if you crowdsource this, you get noise in your database, right? Because one person thinks that, that a uh, porpoise is reptilian for some reason. <laughs> um, and so, so your database can become corrupted. So, so 20 questions. Each time you ask a question, you move down one level in the tree, right? And you declare that you know what the person is thinking of when you get to a leaf node. So if you're allowed to ask 20 questions, you can move down 20 levels before you hit a leaf node, right? So how many possible answers could we store in a database in a decision tree like this if the tree is allowed to have a height of 20? How many leaf nodes can we have? Two to the height, which is 20. So we can have two to the 20th leaf nodes. How big is two to the 20th? Very big. Big. So what's two to the 10th? Yeah, two to the 10th is about 1,000, right? Think a K. I'll put this on the, your final exam. Two to the 10th is about 1,000. So two to the 20th, 1,000 squared, that's a million. So a million possible answers just by asking 20 questions. That's why this game is like so, so uh, hard to defeat if you're playing someone who asks good questions. Because you can discriminate between a million different possible things with just 20 questions, which is kind of cool. You can buy these little like electronic versions of this for a few bucks, and they're, it's annoying how good they are. There's an online version called the Akinator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you can think of like really obscure things and it still like figures it out because a million things you can get pretty obscure. So that's, that's another application of, of a binary tree. Um, and like I say, in 223 we'll actually code this up and I'll give you a big database that you can, you can feed it and it does a really good job. All right, so um, Keep plugging away on PA5 Monday. We'll start looking at that, and then we'll wrap up the course next week. And that'll be it until 223.